All right, page 132, line 270. At the serene king's word, a squire ran to bring the polished harp out of the palace, and place was given to nine referees, peers of the realm, masters of ceremony, who cleared a space and smoothed the dancing floor. The squire brought down and gave Demodocus the clear-toned harp, and centering on the minstrel, magical young dancers formed a circle with a light beat and stamp of feet, beholding Odysseus marveled at the flashing ring. Now to his harp, the blinded minstrel sang of Ares' dalliance with Aphrodite. Now hidden in Hephaestus' house, they played at love together and the gifts of Ares, dishonoring Hephaestus' bed, and how the word that wounds the heart came to the master from Helios, who had seen the two embrace. And when he learned it, Lord Hephaestus went with baleful calculation to his forge. So the song is very familiar to the Greeks. It is the story of Ares' affair with Aphrodite. And now Hephaestus is mad and he goes to his forge. There mightily he armed his anvil block and hammered out a chain whose tempered links could not be sprung or bent. He meant that they should hold. Those shackles fashioned hot in wrath. Hephaestus climbed to the bower and the bed of love pooled all his net of chain around the bedpost and swung it from the rafters overhead. Light as a cobweb, even gods in bliss could not perceive so wonderful his cunning. Seeing his bed now made a snare, he feigned a journey to the trim stronghold of Lemnos, the dearest of earth's towns to him. And Ares, ah, golden Ares watch had its reward, and he beheld the great smith leaving home. How promptly to the famous door he came intent on pleasure with sweet Cytheria, she who had left her father's side, but now sat in her chamber when her lover entered, and tenderly he pressed her hand and said, Come and lie down, my darling, and be happy. Hephaestus is no longer here, but gone to see his grunting Scythian friends on Lemnos. Okay, got the picture. Hephaestus makes this chain web, hangs it over the bed, says he's going to go someplace. Ares has been watching. Ares comes in, visits Aphrodite. Okay, let's jump in the bed. And she too thought repose would be most welcome. The pair went into bed into a shower of clever chains, the netting of Hephaestus. So trust they could not move apart nor rise. At last they knew there would there could be no escape. They were to see the glorious cripple now, for Helios had spied for him and told him. So he turned back this side of Lemnos Isle, sick at heart making his way homeward. Yeah, he might have got his revenge and caught them, but does that really make a guy happy to find out his wife is cheating on him? Now in the doorway of the room, he stood while deadly rage took hold of him. His voice, hoarse and terrible, reached all the gods. Oh, Father Zeus, oh gods and bliss forever, hear is indecorous entertainment for you. Aphrodite, Zeus's daughter, caught in the act cheating me, her cripple, with Ares, devastating Ares. Clean-limbed beauty is her joy, not these bandy legs I came into the world with. No one to blame but the two gods who bred me. Come, see this pair entwining here in my own bed. How hot it makes me burn. I think they may not care to lie much longer, pressing on one another, passionate lovers. They'll have enough of bed together soon, and yet the chain that baked them holds them down till Father sends me back my wedding gifts, all that I poured out for his damned pigeon, so lovely and so wanton. Hephaestus wants to be done with Aphrodite, wants his wedding gifts back. Basically, a divorce among the gods and goddesses. Hmm. All the others were crowding in now to the brazen house, Poseidon who embraces earth and Hermes the runner and Apollo, lord of distance. The goddesses stayed home for shame. 
but these munificences ranged here in the doorway and irrepressible among them all arose the laughter of happy gods gazing hard at Hephaestus handiwork the gods in turn remarked among themselves no dash in adultery now the tortoise tags the hare Hephaestus catches Ares and Ares outran the wind the lame god's craft has binned him. Now shall he pay what is due from God's taken and cuckoldry. They made these improving remarks to one another, but Apollo leaned aside to say to Hermes, Son of Zeus, beneficent wayfinder, would you accept a coverlet of chain if only you lay by Aphrodite's golden side? To this the wayfinder replied, shining, Would I not, though, Apollo of distances, Wrap me in chains three times the weight of these. Come goddesses and gods to see the fun. Only let me lie beside the pale golden one. The gods gave way again to peals of laughter, all but Poseidon, and he never smiled, but urged Hephaestus to unpinion Ares, saying emphatically in a loud voice, Free him. You will be paid, I swear. Ask what you will. He pays up every jot the gods decree. So... Apollo and Hermes are kind of joking about it and saying, well, if we got to be with Aphrodite, would it matter if we're wrapped up in chains for everybody to see? It's worth it. Yeah, these gods are kind of jerks. Okay, but Poseidon doesn't laugh with the rest and he just says, yeah, free them now and you'll get paid back what you do. To this, the great game legs replied, Poseidon, Lord of the earth surrounding sea, I should not swear to a scoundrel's honor. What have I as surety from you if Ares leaves me empty-handed with my empty chain? The earth shaker for answer urged again, Hephaestus, let's grant he goes and leaves the fine unpaid. I swear then I shall pay it. Then said the great game legs at last, no more. You offer terms I cannot well refuse. And down the strong God bent to set them free till disencumbered of their bond, the chain, the lovers leapt away he into Thrace, while Aphrodite, laughter's darling, fled to Kypros, Isle, and Paphos, to her meadow, an altar dim with incense. There the graces bathed and anointed her with golden oil, a bloom that clings upon immortal flesh alone, and let her folds of mantle fall in glory. So ran the song the minstrel sang. So Hephaestus didn't really want to let them out of the chains, um, but Poseidon keeps urging and Poseidon says, look, if Ares doesn't pay, I'll pay. He just kind of wants this to be done with. So rang, the, so ran the song in the minstrel, so ran the song the minstrel sang. Odysseus, listening, found sweet pleasure in the tale among the Phaeacian mariners and oarsmen. And next Alcinius called upon his sons, Helios and Laodamus, to show the dance no one could do as well as they handling a purple ball carven by Polybus. Polybus. One made it shoot up under the shadowing clouds as he leaned backward, bounding high in the air. The other cut its flight far off the ground and neither missed a step as the ball soared. The next turn was to keep it low and shuttling it hard between them while the ring of boys gave them a steady stamping beat. So basically they're doing this dance with a ball being between them, kind of an acrobatic sort of thing. Odysseus now addressed Alcinius. O oh, majesty, model of all your folk, your promise was to show me peerless dancers. Here's the promise kept. I am all wonder. At this Alcinius, in his might rejoicing, said to the seafarers of Phaeacia, Attend me now, Phaeacian lords and captains. Our guest appears a clear-eyed man and wise. Come. Let him feel our bounty as he should. Here are twelve princes of the kingdom, lords paramount, and I, who make 13. Let each one bring a laundered cloak and tunic and add one bar of honorable gold. Keep all our gifts together. Load his arms. Let him go joyous to our evening feast. As for Sea Reach, why, man to man, he'll make amends. And handsomely he blundered. Now all is one acclaim the king's good pleasure, and each one sent a squire to bring his gifts. Meanwhile, Sea Reach found speech again, saying, my lord and model of us all, Alcinius, as you require of me in satisfaction, this broad sword of clear bronze goes to our guest. Its hilt is silver and the ring sheath of new sawn ivory, a costly weapon. So Alcinius wants to make sure they send Odysseus off in style. 
12 princes plus King Alcinius all offer gifts, new clothing and gold. And he kind of makes Sea Reach atone for his insult before. And so Sea Reach gives Odysseus a beautiful bronze sword.